Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Over the last six decades, spacecraft have spread out across the solar system, giving us views of planets from vantage points that we humans could never see. These spacecraft have been amazing works of engineering, equipped with the latest technology, the best sensors available. Some have lasted for years or even decades past their original design life. Even if you're a casual fan of space, you can probably name a bunch of these. Voyager, Pioneer, Cassini, Galileo. Many were built specifically for the target that they were intended to explore. And yet, almost all of them share one big component in common. And it's not one that flew to space. They all had to communicate back to Earth. And they had to do this generally using NASA's or JPL's deep space network. But the deep space network is more than just how these spacecraft phone home. It's used to help them navigate to their target. It's used to perform science when they are at their target. And of course, the communications is a two-way process. Spacecraft engineers use the deep space network to send up new programs, to solve problems, to keep missions actually running. There are several cases where the intervention of the deep space network was essential to making sure the spacecraft was able to perform its function. And so, of course, I wanted to make a little video about this to talk about this fantastic asset that has been built up around the world for NASA and is also used by other space agencies that work with NASA because the deep space network is largely unique. It works all around the world. It can work 24 hours a day. It can serve multiple missions simultaneously. These days, the Deep Space Network is part of NASA's Space Communications and Navigations Network. So that includes the Near Space Network, which is a series of ground stations all around the world that can talk to satellites in low Earth orbit as they pass by. It includes the Tracking Data Relay satellites, which sit up in geostationary orbit, and those talk down to spacecraft in orbit, such as the International Space Station. The Deep Space Network is three sites separated by about 120 degrees degrees of longitude. So the original site is Goldstone in California. There's a second site in Canberra, Australia, and a third site near Madrid in Spain. So between those three sites, it's usually possible to keep spacecraft in deep space continuously monitored as the Earth rotates. And roughly speaking, they consider deep space to be more or less anything beyond geostationary orbit. Although in theory, it could be used for closer objects. The further away the object is, the easier it is to track the object. So the Deep Space Network officially came into being in 1963. But it had begun before that. It was an originally created as part of your JPL and the US Army's development of lunar probes. Those would eventually become pioneer probes when NASA came into being. And the various sites that were set up eventually got collected into the Deep Space Network. When the scientists came up with the idea of developing this into a worldwide network, initially they were going to have their base in Goldstone in California because that was relatively close to JPL. And then the two other places, originally they were going to put one in Nigeria and the next one in the Philippines. But it was pointed out that if they moved these sites away from the equator, then they could cover near space work and they could cover a wider range of latitudes. So they chose, instead of the Philippines, they moved it south towards Australia. And for, instead of Nigeria, originally they chose a site down in South Africa. By the time the site in South Africa was built up, it became a bit politically problematic. Or there wasn't officially an opening ceremony with NASA in attendance. It operated, I think, until 1974 and then was basically NASA got out and set up a new facility in Madrid. In Australia, the site was originally set up near Woomera, which was a missile range. It was a great place if you were going to be doing rocket stuff because you had people that were experts in talking to spacecraft and rockets that were just there. However, they only built one big antenna at uh, Woomera, and then they moved to a new site near Canberra, and that's where they've built the majority of their network since then. I think the, Can the Woomera site no longer operates. In all three cases, the sites are chosen because they're naturally in valleys or uh, depressions in the terrain, and that means there's ridges surrounding them that protect them from stray radio waves which might interfere with their operation. 
The first major component of the network was DSS-11, that's Deep Space Station, also known as Pioneer. This was a 26 meter dish, which was, well, it was built for the Pioneer probes. It first entered operation in December of 1958, tracking Pioneer 3 as it tried and failed to get to the moon. The dish would continue to operate right through to 1981. Another old dish is DSS-12, also known as ECHO, because it was involved in Project ECHO, where they bounced radio waves off the, a balloon in orbit that was also known as the ECHO satellite. Now, if you remember, I made a video about the Horn antenna in New Jersey that was also used to discover the cosmic microwave background. Well, this was the other end of that connection. It only operated for communications until 1964. It was then moved to a new location and it's now been working as a radio telescope. It's had its antenna area expanded. I think it went from 26 meters to 34 meters and it's now called the um, Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope, which is used for education. But the oldest dish still operating at Goldstone is DSS-14 Mars. And that was built in the 1960s. It came online in 1966. It was a 64 meter antenna. It has been, since then, it has been expanded to 70 meters. That was when uh, Voyager was getting close to Neptune and they wanted to be absolutely sure they were getting as much data as possible. And more than 50 years later, this uh, antenna is still operating as the, the most sensitive receiver at the Goldstone site. Since these sites have been operating for 60 years or more, there have been other improvements in the electronics. I mean, over time, they've got lower and lower noise amplifiers. They've got more stable frequency sources. They've switched from the early space probes using the L band up through the S, the, the X, and some spacecraft now even use K band for communication. So that's down starting at like 900 megahertz range going all the way up to 40 gigahertz or above. I mean, to get an idea of the difference in performance, the Kepler spacecraft, it had a downlink which was in X-band that could go up to 16 kilobits per second under ideal circumstances. It also had a K-band transmitter which could deliver data at about 4.3 megabits per second. Some of the early spacecraft that went into deep space, they were delivering data down at you know, bits per second rather than kilobits per second. And 60 years of technological innovations have also delivered new modulation schemes, which enable more data in the same bandwidth. And uh, also the development of error correcting codes that let you use more of a noisy channel, uh, you know, basically because you expect or you can account for some of the bits being flipped and reconstruct the original data, you can transmit at lower powers or higher bandwidths. And so I read or I heard one particular source that said over you know, 50 years progress, the Deep Space Network has improved its data throughput capabilities by a factor of about 10 to the power 13. That's a factor of 10 trillion. And of course, not all spacecraft that they're talking to can use all of these technologies, mostly because they were launched before these technologies existed. They still talk to the Voyager spacecraft, which are hundreds of AU out in deep space. Many modern spacecraft can, in fact, receive software updates, and that was essential to rescuing the Galileo mission, a mission where the Deep Space Network made this heroic effort to basically make this probe work. The space probe, if you don't know, it was originally going to launch in the mid-1980s. The space shuttle disaster, uh, the Challenger disaster meant that it was pushed back. Uh, it spent a lot longer in storage than it was intended to, and then it spent a lot longer flying in space. So when they finally unfurled the antenna, it jammed. They didn't have their major uplink or downlink. And so they were facing the potential of going to Jupiter with a data rate of like 8 bits per second or possibly worse. And what they did was they modified the software on the spacecraft to add data compression, to add new error correction capabilities, because with the data rates being so low, the CPU had the capability to you know implement these. And the Deep Space Network itself added hardware to make sure that it would get as much data from this spacecraft as possible. In the end, they were able to get data, peak data rates of 160 bits per second, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it was enough to do some really important science at Jupiter. They still had to make sacrifices. They had wanted to have really high cadence images of the turbulence of the Jupiter's atmosphere, and that just wasn't possible with the data rates they had. 
But right now we have Juno, which is pretty much dedicated to observing Jupiter's atmosphere, albeit in completely different wavelengths. And speaking about different wavelengths, the next step for the Deep Space Network is to add optical communications to their dishes. So they're already experimenting with a telescope and a spacecraft, uh, but when they're actually going to go operational, they will not want to be borrowing somebody's telescope for this. So they're going to modify the dishes with a telescope meter, uh, mirror in the inner you know, 10 meters or so, while the rest of it will remain a radio receiver. Now, there's a really cool website that lets you see what Deep Space Network is doing right now. Uh, basically, it shows you the activity on all the dishes with transmission, uh, uplink, downlink being shown, and what they're talking to. So, for example, DSS-63 is receiving data from Voyager 1 at 160 bits per second at 8.42 gigahertz and some very small power numbers. Um, on the other hand, DSS-65 is currently talking, sending data up to SOHO and receiving data at the same time. Uh, elsewhere, this uh, DSS-24 at Goldstone is trying to send commands to Capstone, but it's not getting any data down. Meanwhile, DSS-14, the largest dish they have, is trying to receive data from Capstone. They're trying to debug a problem right now, and they need the biggest antenna listening for it to see if they get any signal out. You'll also notice that DSS-25 is looking at three different spacecraft, because these three spacecraft are all at Mars. Therefore, they're right next to each other in the sky, and they can use a single dish for them. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Deep Space Network isn't just for communications. It's also used for navigation and doing science. So on the navigation front, they have a radio system that's talking to a satellite. So first of all, they can just measure the distance to that satellite by sending pings and measuring the response time. They can measure the Doppler shift on the transmission, therefore get a radial distance. But getting an angular position on the sky, that is a little harder, and that's sometimes essential to a mission. So... What they do is take a page from very long baseline interferometry. It's a process called delta door or delta differential one-way ranging, where two of the antenna, they synchronize their clocks, typically using a pulsar, and then they do very accurate range measurements to the spacecraft. And by knowing the difference in the range, they know the exact angle and so they can get very high precision angular uh, location data. This is not always done because it's actually quite complicated. It requires synchronizing the uh, telescopes or the antenna, and it requires dedicated multiple antenna to this process. Most notably, it wasn't used for Mars Climate Orbiter. And of course, that spacecraft ended up burning up in the atmosphere of Mars after a navigation error due to one of the contractors using Imperial units rather than far more sensible metric units. There are a number of ways the network is used directly for science. Obviously, they have high power transmitters and sensitive receivers. They can use these for radar imaging of asteroids and comets that come close to the Earth. For larger objects, it's possible to get radar reflections from much further away. This is an early observation of Venus that was made using Deep Space Network antenna. And in fact, uh, Deep Space Network, early on it did l radar ranging of Venus, and it discovered that Venus rotated retrograde, and they also pinned down the orbit of Venus with more accuracy. And if they hadn't done this, hadn't got this improved orbit, then when Mariner 2 was launched, it would have probably missed Venus by far enough that the mission wouldn't have been as successful as it was. Now, for more distant objects, the radar reflection just would be too weak, but you can use spacecraft that are already at the target to send radio waves through, for example, the potential atmosphere of Pluto to see if there was any uh, attenuation. Similarly, they also did this for Charon. In fact, the transit through the Pluto system was you know, sort of hinged on making sure that the trajectory would allow radar occultation measurements to be made of both Pluto and Charon. And of course, that requires incredible navigation precision. So in this case, DSN contributed twice. High precision navigation measurements can be science in and of themselves. For example, the Juno spacecraft, as it's orbiting Jupiter, they're getting uh, accurate Doppler measurements of the velocity. And through this, they've discovered stuff about the interior of Jupiter. They think now that the core of Jupiter is fuzzier than they originally thought. And that's, you know, changed our ideas of how Jupiter formed. We used to think that the core would form first and get compact, and then it would suck in all the gas over the top. 
if that if uh, that happened, you wouldn't have this big diffuse core. Now, some models suggest that you formed a big Jupiter, but there was another Jupiter, you know, large gas giant in the area, and they collided and stirred up the interior. The Deep Space Network is so important to planetary science that when missions are developed and planned, they incorporate the DSN into the science experiments. It's you know, understood that they could have these capabilities available to them. And it's not just US missions. The, the DSN is used for many international missions. While most national space programs will have capabilities to communicate with their spacecraft, they may not have the worldwide capability to maintain continuous communication and get all the science during those times when there's a, a lot of new information coming in. And the Deep Space Network itself has to look at what missions are out there which might be coming down the pipeline and make sure that they will have the capabilities to can talk and get the most out of their science. And that does mean investing and expanding both in terms of new technologies and new hardware, new dishes. If you're a spacecraft designer building an extraterrestrial spacecraft that needs to do science, navigate, and of course, phone home, you're going to make sure that it has the Deep Space Network on speed dial. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.